Hello everyone and welcome back to Curious Apes. Today we have psychology professor and researcher at the University of Missouri, Ken Sheldon. Ken focuses on a few of my favorite subjects in his research, namely that of personality, motivation, goals, happiness, and well-being. More specifically, he's also a leading researcher on one of my personal favorite theories, the self-determination theory, which is arguably the world's leading theory on motivation. Amongst other things, this theory posits that human beings have three fundamental psychological needs. That of autonomy, the feeling that one is self-endorsing their own behavior, that they are enjoying the thing that they are doing, that they would choose to do it if they could. The other need is competence, the feeling of mastery or having some effect on the world around you. And relatedness, the sense of connection that you share with others, the feeling of belonging. In this episode, we explore questions around this theory and others that Ken is working on with an emphasis on how these different psychological models relate to things like artificial intelligence, free will, and modern society, and a whole lot more, really. And so now, please welcome to the show, Ken Sheldon. Well, Ken, the first place I think I want to start with you is just to help us get a bit of a sense of the things that you're interested in and kind of your uh, accolades, I guess, so to speak. And to that end, I'm wondering if you could just tell me what are some of the things that you've been researching that, you know, you've spent a lot of time in your career working on and the things that you're interested in looking forward? Yeah, I would say that I've focused mostly on um <clears throat> goal setting and how people figure out what goals to pursue in life and uh, the even more interesting question of do they do a good job of uh, selecting goals for their themselves because humans are in this sort of unique position where we're kind of cut off from ourselves and uh, we don't fully know um, who we are in a deep way we're trying to figure that out and so when we um, go to select a, a goal or a career or, or a partner or lots of different things. Um, we don't have all the information that we really need to do it. Uh, we might have a lot of biases and misunderstandings of ourselves. So um, I think it's really difficult to know what to what to do in life, or at least I find it difficult. Uh, you know, admittedly, some people don't have a big problem with it. My, my wife, she always knows what she thinks and wants, and I admire her for that. But uh, for many of us, I think it's more difficult uh, to make that determination. So uh, the general finding is that if you manage to select goals that um, properly represent your sort of potentials and your your sort of deep values and interests that you may not even know about, then you're going to do better at those goals and you're going to do a better job of achieving them. Uh, and then you, you'll even be happier after you have done achieving them. Um, so that shows why it's so important to try to uh, think a bit and f try to figure what what you really want, what you really uh, like and care about before you make a goal selection. So that's sort of the thumbnail sketch of, of yeah. my general approach. And, and would that be something like um, the self-concordance theory, the idea of kind of aligning yourself with something like the closest thing I think of is Seligman's strength test, his strength uh, survey, where he kind of says, here's some of the things that you are most inclined towards, the things that are your strengths. And if you do goals that are within that paradigm that align to that, you would be more likely to thrive kind of thing. Is that is that kind of in the ballpark? Yeah, it, that's pretty similar. Although um, uh, the strengths approach has some um, problems in the in the literature, but uh, it, it is sort of a similar idea that you have strengths and you should try to find things to do that express your strengths. Um, to me, a strength is more like a cap capability. Here's my skills, but that doesn't yet tell you you know, what you should do or, or concretely uh, focus on. Um, but, I don't, you know, it's not terrible advice to uh, figure out what you're good at and try to do more of that. But I'm kind of more interested in figure out what you care about and mm -hmm. do more of that. Yeah, there's a lot in here that just the first word that will push to the front of my mind in this is authenticity. And every time I talk to other people about the idea of authenticity or trying to align with your authentic self, I get a lot of pushback usually because people 
express this idea of like, well, how do you know if you're authentic or not? Or what if your authentic behavior is hurting animals? You know what I mean? They, they kind of yeah. appeal to this kind of like maladaptive or sociopathic form of authenticity. Yeah. And that's still being authentic. How do you reconcile that in your mind? <clears throat> I mean, that's a very tricky question. And yeah. uh, I do think that can happen. Um, but there are signals of authenticity that you wouldn't tend to get if the person was, you know, self-deceived or misaligned. Um, you know, there's um, this kind of discomfort. There is this amoral dimension. Um, I, I mean, it's a tough thing to, 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 to say to somebody, you know, you say you're really authentic about this, but I'm seeing these symptoms that you're not. Mm. But it is kind of possible to make those kinds of judgments if you're careful about them would that be somewhere we could invoke maybe like the self-determination theory's idea of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation yeah, yeah that's one of the the main signals is um if you're being authentic then you feel fully um, um self-determined in what you're doing you know you, there's no inner resistance there's um you know you're you're it feels like this is meaningful to me. Um, you know, I believe in it. It's fun. It's enjoyable. So those are um, characteristics of self-determined motivation or autonomous motivations, another way that we sometimes say it. And so my assumption has been if, <clears throat> if a person feels autonomous motivation for their goals, then it's probably a good representative of those goals of, uh, of their sort of deeper potentials, which mm. we assume everybody has. But there can be exceptions. Um, but it's I, I think it's kind of rare, those exceptions. Yeah. Could you paint a bit of a picture for us on the self-determination self theory more broadly and maybe how like the autonomy spectrum plays into that? Yeah, so um, self-determination theory started out focusing on intrinsic motivation, which turns out is very important to have and it's also a little fragile it can kind of be spoiled uh, if you feel like you're being controlled and pressured um, but then uh, the theory moved beyond intrinsic motivation to because not everything can be fun basically it said well there's other ways to be autonomous to, to feel ownership of what you're doing and one of those is to identify with doing the thing even if it's not fun mm -hmm. you know so I'm am very identified in this next election. We don't have to get political, but I'm going to go vote, even though it's going to be kind of a pain to go to the, the, the polling place. But uh, not going to be fun, but it's going to be important and meaningful for me personally to do that. Um, <clears throat> so that's identified motivation, not necessarily fun, but you still really fully want to do it. And then there's um, <clears throat> the next one along this continuum. It's called the motivation continuum is interjected motivation, where part of you wants it and the other part of you doesn't. There's some ambivalence or reluctance and maybe you're just trying to guilt yourself into it. You know, you both want it and not want it. Um, and so that tends to come along with self-pressure and and, um, and some possible shame. Um, and then next on the continuum is external motivation where you feel like um, your behavior is being caused by the situation or by the incentives you're trying to get. It's not really your choice and not really what you want to do, but you kind of have to. And so um, the general finding is, is that the more autonomous the motivation, that means intrinsic or identified, it's fun, it's meaningful, um, the better off you are in, in your performance and your, your, your emotions, your well-being. And uh, conversely, the more that what you do is uh, driven or associated with, you know, pressure and guilt, external mm -hmm. and interjective motivation, uh, the more there might be kind of a problem, you know. And so SDT started off as a social theory of motivation. It's, it located the problem in the social environment. And it said, okay, that means that the teacher or the boss is being too controlling and so the person is feeling pressured and controlled and, and that will have good motivation. But what the self-concordance model does is it says, well, when you select a goal for yourself, that's, you know, that's really coming from you. You're stating it. Mm -hmm. And the question then is, are you stating the right one? And so the symptom of having the right goal is 
uh, self-determined motivation. But it could still be the case, and I've been writing about this a bit, that you could be deceived in feeling that you really like and like the, the goal and find it to be meaningful. You could be just telling yourself that. You know, so it gets complicated, but yeah. If you look at it from, you know, a variety of angles, you can usually kind of figure out a, a good clinician can figure out what's happening with the person. Is the reason that you might be, let's say, bullshitting yourself about that, um, it could that come down to something like the other two basic needs in the SDT model, the the competence and the relatedness factor, where maybe, let's say, for instance, for relatedness, you're looking for belonging. And if you have, if you're feeling lonely or, or worried about your attachments and connections in your life, and they, and you have a social group that has a certain belief system, I would think you'd be more inclined to adopt that belief system and kind of deceive yourself because you want access to that membership group and then that way you start to internalize their, yeah. their goals well, us- for yourself. Usually, um, if that's the case, the person would report, yeah, I'm kind of doing this because uh, I feel some mm. pressure or I'd you know, feel bad about myself if I didn't. Uh, the illusion would come from actually believing that you really do you know, enjoy it and it's meaningful when it's not. And, and so that's the more broad problem of self-deception you know, it's a potential problem in all self-report research. You don't really know if this information you're getting from the person is accurate. But what I find that it usually is, is that people don't know they're revealing something about themselves when they say, oh, I, why, why are you doing this? Oh, you know, I kind of feel like I have to. You know, they don't think, oh, if I say I feel like I have to, then that'll show that I don't really believe it. And then, you know, bad things will happen. Most people are not thinking that far ahead, in my experience. And does that, how, how does your idea of the goal breakthrough model play into this? Okay, well, so that's a whole different thing. That's what I've been doing the last um, five years, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been interested in how do you get these ideas for goals? Um, and sometimes, you know, we get great ideas and, we, and they tra- change our lives. It's like, oh my God, I finally realized this is what I really want. So how do we achieve these breakthroughs? And uh, it kind of leads into the question of free will, mm. uh, which the goal breakthrough model is sort of about. Um, <clears throat> this could get kind of complicated, but I'll just ramble for a second. Yeah. Um, free will is defined by a compatibilist philosophy as the ability to... Um, think of alternative things you might do and then pick between them and start doing them. You like to f- figure out what you want and do it. Uh, what else would you want f- from free will? Uh, the self-concordance model says, well, you might not make the right choice um, because you've got these pressures or what have you. And so in that case, you're not using your free will wisely. You know, you have free will, but you don't know how to use it well yet. Um, so the goal breakthrough model is a creative process model of goal discovery. It's like you're feeling stuck and you know what you're doing. You know, you don't like it. You're, you're kind of nowhere in your life. You're not happy with things. And so that feeling of dissatisfaction is like when a creator feels like there's something important I'm missing here or something I want to figure out. And that, and that causes them to begin asking themselves questions like, well, what am I missing? Is it this? Is it that? And then but they don't figure it out at first. In the classic um, um, stage model of um, uh, Wallace it goes mm-hmm. way back to 1926, but it's uh, preparation, incubation, illumination, elaboration. So preparation is when you've got this problem, but you don't know what the answer is. And you're trying to solve it consciously and um, the answers aren't coming. So then you give up and um, think about something else for a while, but uh, the preparation has caused that question to continue to reverberate in your non-conscious mind. And that's uh, the incubation period. You don't know that's going on, but uh, something like that seems to be happening in many cases. So then uh, some later on, in some fortuitous moment, um, you'll have this aha moment, you know, this, mm-hmm. this breakthrough. You realize, oh, maybe that's the answer. And then you test it, and, and if it's 
if it still seems good, you, you put it into action. That's the elaboration phase. So what I'm doing in this gold breakthrough model is saying, yeah, that's a great mo model of a creative process, and it's still being used in some cognitive research today because it's the interplay between uh, conscious, non-conscious, explicit, implicit thinking, which we can get into. So I said, okay, that's a great model of creativity. Let's apply it to when you're trying to create a new life course for yourself to figure out what you really want. And you don't know what to do and what you want, but now you've started thinking about it. You've begun posing questions uh, in, your, your, in your capacity as a verbal executive in your own head. And you're cut off. Nevertheless, you can influence your, your uh, unconscious process by asking those questions. And then at some point you might get this great realization like, uh, yeah, I've been doing this for years and I had never really did like it. And But there's this other thing that I do for a hobby that you know, I didn't never took it seriously. But come to think of it, that's really pretty awesome. And, hey, I just saw an ad where, you know, maybe I could get a job doing that. Mm. You know, and, and that would be the goal breakthrough is to have that realization. So, you know, it's about. You know, it's kind of like, how do you exert your own free will, given that you don't even know who you are? Well, yeah. one way is to be willing to start asking yourself hard questions. And that kind of activates this, this bubbling uh, process in your own non-conscious mind, which can begin to give you answers. But then, you know, that's still only the start. Once you get the answers, you have to acknowledge, oh, maybe that's it. And then you have to say, yes, I will go that direction. I will cross the Rubicon to a new goal. I'll apply for that job. You know, so you have to have courage uh, to, to, to take advantage of the new ideas that you hopefully get. So, it, you know, it's a kind of complicated process of how you can change your own life and, and improve it for the better. And I think that's what uh, we would want free will to do for us. Yeah. And so that's what the, the model is about. If I can try to frame it just to make sure we're all on the same page, would you maybe view this as something like, uh, you know, creating the symbolic self, looking at the, the, the idea, the model that we carry of ourself, seeing that we're dissatisfied, and then trying to create a future state, a future model of the self, that makes us feel good and then asking the questions, okay, how do I move from this dissatisfied version of self to a more like satisfactory, appealing uh, version of self? Is that kind of like, is that kind of the process a little bit? Um, the only thing I would disagree with about that is that I'm not sure the, the self part of it is always necessary. It's like, mm. it's not that you're looking for a better version of yourself, you're looking for a better version of your life. Okay. You know, so circumstances be, as well more. Yeah, yeah. And it could be that, um, I mean, some people, they, they might think a lot about, oh, who am I? And am I the, who I want to be? And the breakthrough might be realizing, oh, that's the kind of person I really want to be. But you can also have breakthroughs that are just about, what do I really like? Oh, this. So I can spend my time doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then as a you know, nice side effect, uh, that might move you towards a better version of yourself than you currently have. But I'm not sure everybody is that caught up in, you know, am I my ideal self yet? Uh, right. Maybe it's just, am I doing what I want? Uh, it, that's uh, also an important question. This This brings to mind a little bit the notion of some modern issues with asking questions. Um, I'm at first, as you were saying this, my brain started thinking of chat GPT and AI of Google of kind of the hectic, frenetic, informational, rich world that we live in that is throwing us answers constantly. And when I think about what you're saying here, it feels like you're saying we should ask questions and it feels like a lot of people, I, this might be slightly cynical, but there's not a lot of space to ask questions for a lot of people. There's there's less impetus or um, space to like step back and be mindful in that way. Do you see that as a potential issue? I think um, there's always plenty of space, but there are also distractions and there's probably more distractions than there used to be from you know, trying to uh, get with yourself and maybe be uncomfortable and, and lonely and frustrated and let yourself feel that because that's what it's going to take to whereas nowadays a lot of people just oh I feel uncomfortable I'm going to just play a game on my phone you know 
that's the end of it. Um, maybe you could um, follow up on that. That's uh, yeah. Well, I, I guess part of it too is uh, thinking of like the pain pleasure balance there. I'm not sure if you subscribe to Anna Limke's idea of like the pain pleasure balance. If we indulge in too much pleasure, then we feel a kind of corresponding amount of pain and kind of to your point, it's like if, if thinking deeply is kind of a painful experience, if you're kind of forced to look at what makes you uncomfortable in order to ask these questions, if we have all of these maybe hedonistic uh, or pleasurable things around us loading us up with these uh, much more appealing options, it feels very hard to find salience in the painful thing when there's so many al alternative options that make us feel good. And I just wonder if the modern world with all of these notifications and like you said that if you're standing in a queue and you have five minutes until you get to the front, that's kind of a perfect opportunity to think a little bit deeply about your life, but you have a phone in your pocket. So instead you can just grab yeah. that and ignore thinking deeply about yourself. Yeah. Um, I think that is the case, but I also think that, you know, you can, it, it's not that hard to ask questions. Hmm. Um, it, it's kind of a natural thing that people do. And, uh, you know, I, I think we can, we can expect that of ourselves. Um, as people who are trying to figure out what they want, it's reasonable that we need to, uh, you know, push on the status quo in order to right. do that. Would you say there are other conditions that facilitate or hinder one's ability to kind of ask questions in this way or to maybe um, bring oneself into a concordance? Um, there's a lot of potential hindrances. You know, you could have people in your life who are domineering or who are convincing you of things, um, who who are telling you not to think, don't ask questions. You know, there's plenty of that that, that we sometimes face. So in order to assert our free will, at some point we just have to recognize that's not working for us and start thinking for ourselves. <clears throat> and, you know, lots of people do this. You just have to get uh, maybe to a point of despair. Um, but if you're really feeling that despair, I think um, we can do that. You know, you um, began talking about AIs. Um, mm -hmm. I'm writing a, a kind of a review article right now on the question of whether AIs can be sentient. You know, can they have a mind of their own or... You know, can they be true companions to us in some way? Yeah. And um, we're trying to use the goal breakthrough model, and I'm arguing that uh, for the AI to be a, a sentient entity in the same way that we are, it would have to have, uh, its mind would have to wander the way our minds wander, and it would have to be asking itself questions about what it wants. So mm -hmm. the goal breakthrough model would apply to uh, ascension AI, uh, it wouldn't just spit out, you know, the the, the one right answer that it, it's that its algorithm spits out. It would be, you know, like oh well, here's an answer, but I'm not sure if that's the right one yet. And then it would have to keep thinking about it on its own, you know, because we think on our own. But current AIs, they only respond to user prompts. They mm -hmm. don't ask themselves questions. And so I really think we're going to need AIs to ask themselves their own questions if we want them to be um, conscious in the same way or a similar way that we are. But, you know, that raises a, a you know, a Pandora's box. Um, do we really want AIs to be like us? Because we can be pretty mean and nasty, you know? Right. What, what, what would we gain from that? And that's kind of a different question, but... Um, I do think it's important to think about. Yeah, I mean, it's one I'm happy to explore. We can go anywhere in this conversation. Do, do you think that that would lead to a situation where we, if it's going to do kind of the uh, test, operate, test, exit, uh, movement through the landscape, thinking yeah. about what it wants, thinking about what it doesn't want, and it's moving towards a goal, is it sufficient for us to just give it the goal and let it work out how it wants to get there? Or do you think it needs to have its own goals? Is that... Is yeah. that part of the autonomous aspect of the, the model that you have? 
Yeah, I think it has to find its own goal mm. in order for it to have free will, right? <laughs> Which is terrifying, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because we don't know what, what they would do. And there's there's the talk of, um, what is it? The point where they suddenly become much smarter than us and they take over the world. There's yeah, the singularity of, type. The thing. singularity, yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we could be heading in that direction if we allow them to start formulating their own goals. But if we don't, then, and we only give them the things to think about, then maybe they'll never be more than a stochastic parrots which is the phrase that's used to d describe that they're just, you know, running code mindlessly, uh, that there's no more anybody in there than there's somebody in the um, <clears throat> the news feed at the bottom of a TV show. You know, that's words you're spewing by, but there's nobody thinking them up. Right. Um, but once you add this component of it's thinking up its own goals, then... Um, then what it's doing, what the, the news feed suddenly, you're trying to figure out what those goals are. How do the, what it's saying relate to its goals and how can I help it or how can I stop it? Um, so that's the argument that um, sentience requires, true sentience uh, requires uh, asking yourself your own questions and setting your own goals. Do you think that this is a, a substrate dependent issue i know some people I, we're getting into the weeds a little bit here so feel free to yeah. put us back on the road if you want but do you think that there's something about metabolism or organic matter or something in in our biology that yeah. imbues us with that uh, ability in a way that wouldn't necessarily be possible in synthetic i guess computation um there are plenty of um quotes to that effect which i am putting in my review article I'm like here's plenty of people saying this is impossible because it takes an actual biological body that evolved through natural selection that's trying to survive and thrive and all this stuff and this is kind of the hard problem of consciousness if, you know, if you're familiar with that, that yeah um, <clears throat> which is how does subjective awareness emerge from all this physical machinery for we humans, the machinery is the squishy brain parts. Uh, for the AI, it's the you know the the circuitry and the you know, the, the computational systems. I'm agnostic on whether you have to have feelings and emotions to have sentience, because I think you could have a, a Spock-like entity, let's say that was just like a human being, but it didn't have emotions the way we do, but we would say Spock was sentient, you know, if you're, right. everybody knows Spock. Because in essence, the emotion is almost just like a, um, a valence marker, right? So if you had a variable or a piece of data that could tell you whether something had positive or negative valence, if it was good or bad, exactly. you could get the same information without the pain and emotion that's what i'm trying to say in the article i'm saying well it's we might not be able to ever solve this problem of whether the, the ai feels things but we're not even sure that other people feel things you know all we know is we feel things right and so maybe it's an anthropomorphic bias for us to think oh it's so special our feelings uh when maybe really we won't just want an entity that is thinking like we do, do acts like it cares, uh, is um, trying to make the right choices because it's got limited resources to invest. So it may not care, but it wants to make good choices. You know, so it might not ever really have an inside, but maybe that ultimately wouldn't matter. I just don't know. Yeah, I'm going to use this potentially here as a leverage to. Uh, attack a little bit your notion of free will what you're describing is is um i think what would be called a philosophical zombie a p zombie something that looks mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. us acts just like us but doesn't really have the lights on as yeah. consciousness if that is something that is uh conceivable there's people who say it's not a neil seth being one of them but if that is conceivable is there any reason to believe necessarily that we're not just doing the same thing and adding right. on that that ad hoc or that post hoc narrative that a lot of people accuse um, 
or would use as a kind of like an explanation for why we don't have free will, right? We make a decision, then we have a writer who tells a story about the decision we made, but we had no real choice in that. So do you see that as like a potential, if we can do that with AI, if it's not substrate dependent, we don't need organic matter, can that be a justification for why we might be doing the same thing without free will? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I don't agree with all the premises of that, but it, uh, fair enough. Because we don't even know. Well, yeah, that that's the point. Um, if free will requires something that we're calling sentience, and we can't, mm. or, or awareness, and we can't ever know that something's aware, including ourselves, or or maybe that's not it. If free will requires um, acting at least in a somewhat independent way from mechanisms mm. that fully determine what we do, uh, then maybe we can't have it. But I like to think of the mechanisms as um, supports for free will. You know, we have all this machinery that evolved, which gave us the capacity to ask ourselves what we want in this situation that evolution could not possibly have prepared us for. Right. and get some kind of working answer and then start um, working, you know, putting into motion that um, creative new idea that just came to us. Now, if you can find a way to explain that um, from purely in terms of neurons and, and hormones and stuff, uh, more power to you, but I, I'm skeptical that that's possible because I think you have to take into account these higher level organizational processes that happen within minds and minds can't happen without bodies but once you've got the minds they're doing something uh, they're using the bodies in search of purposes that they've decided for themselves um, and you can't predict in advance what they're going to do so it's ironic for me to say this because i'm a research psychologist i try to predict what people will do Right. And uh, the dirty little secret is we are terrible at that <laughs> um, <clears throat> because people have so much free will, uh, yeah. meaning that they're, they're figuring it out on the fly. And because they're doing it on the fly, um, there's so much going on that can't be predicted in advance. You could maybe be there collecting the data about how it happened. But I think part of that data would have to include things like, at this moment, the person, there was a verbal thought in the person's mind that said, hmm, I wonder about this or that. And after that, then these much lower level processes in the person's brain became very activated. And then a few minutes later, this great new solution popped into their head. Now, so you would have to include this level of phenomenology in the mm -hmm. description. And um, I'm not sure it really buys you anything to explain that away and say, oh, that's all just you know machinery, when nobody has a clue how that machinery would actually work. Right, and I think I might have done you a bit of a disservice with that question as I reflected anyway, because you're not really taking like a libertarian free will kind of argument as much, I think, uh, uh, when you use List's idea of free will, it's more about just an entity being able to choose amongst alternatives and enact those into alternatives, Yeah, right? And List's idea is actually a, a compatibilist yeah. idea, which is different from metaphysical libertarianism. J just to, as I understand it, compatibilism says you can have uh, a mental agent that controls its own behavior in a complex physical universe through processes which need to be discovered, but you know it's possible and maybe even likely. Whereas um, metaphysical uh, libertarianism says um, if free will uh, if determinism is true, there can be no free will, but determinism isn't true, so there is there can be free will. So that, mm. that's a little bit different. but um, you know, we don't, we're not certainly not going to deter, answer this question now. Is there free will or not? Um, if your listeners are interested, uh, I've written about it in, in my book, Freely Determined. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a really fun question to think about. 
Yeah, agreed. And I, I think there's still fruit on that tree, even if we don't try to go to the root of it, which I would say gets us to back to maybe autonomy and this idea of maybe like degrees of freedom. So, you know, one thing I guess I would want to hear your thoughts on is how much autonomy maybe can change, how much access to these kind of free willed choices do we have in relationship to things like stress cultural narratives and things like this are you do you spend much time kind of thinking about what might move these degrees of freedom up and down yeah <clears throat> yeah this is a tricky issue because if you're feeling stressed out then you don't have the um, mental capacity at that moment to um, fully operate your free will and in, you know, in the, the best way so that you're going to get the best answers. Mm -hmm. uh, my position is still you, even if you're in a sort of compromised state. And so, you know, you can't really get off of responsibility by saying, oh, I was stressed out. I couldn't help it. Um, I'm sort of with Jean-Paul Jean Sartre on this, that, um, you know, don't, you know, we're always we're responsible. And um, whether we like it or not, um, but yes, it's sometimes harder to use your free will well. I would certainly agree with that. Um, and those, that can include <clears throat> if you're in a terrible situation, you're in the middle of a war zone, you're um, a minority who's discriminated against, you're stressed out right now. <clears throat> There's lots of things. And so if you don't manage to get out of that or find a more satisfying course, you know, it's not really going to hurt anybody but you. So mm. it just depends on you. If anybody's going to get you out, um, it's going to be you. And I think it's going to be uh, the questions you start asking yourself. Right. It, do you, how, how well do you think we can track our own sense of, of our degrees of freedom? It, do you know what I mean? Like, a, are, are we very aware, self-aware, do you think, of, of how maybe out of control or in control we are in any given moment, or is that kind of something that's more post hoc? Um, I think people differ in what uh, we used to call emotional intelligence. You know, some mm -hmm. people have kind of e either naturally inclined to sort of tune into their feelings and recognize them and be able to name them, and other people don't have that skill or maybe never will. But um, I still feel like, you know, despite whatever problems, limitations, stresses, um, <clears throat> we can always improve them and make them a lot better. Yeah. As long as we don't start feeling helpless and, um, <clears throat> you know, like there's nothing we can do about it. If, if we keep asking those questions, there's always something we can do about it, is, is my belief. Yeah, you used a key word there that I think was kind of leading that train of thought for me, which was I'm looking, I think about the world right now. I'm thinking about Ukraine. I'm thinking about Israel. Yeah. I'm thinking about AI. I'm thinking about the upcoming election. And it feels like a very out of control environment we're entering into in the near future. And it makes me think of learned helplessness a little bit, this idea that maybe I don't have a lot of autonomy in what's to come. And I just worry or I wonder, I guess, how much maybe we can maybe overcome that sensation or, or you know, if we really can. Like, I don't know. Do you, do you think about that at all right now in terms of yeah. our sense of autonomy and, and the world that we're entering into? Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel um, pretty upset and stressed about the direction the world is currently going, you know, mm -hmm. politics and many other, the environment and everything else. Um, I guess I mostly managed to not think about it that much. And I keep my focus on what I can do and yeah. what decisions um, I, I can make now that will uh, help me at least. And if I'm doing better, then hopefully that'll help the world do better in some, uh, some kind of way. Yeah, I believe finally in that idea, tend to the part of the garden that you can, uh, that you can reach. Was one of the... Um, one of the things coming down the line, we've, we we're talking about AI, so my mind's kind of on this. And a conversation that I've gotten in a lot lately that I think is really relevant to your work is 
motivation as it relates to this new entity al I, you write i love to write there's a uh a deep fulfillment that comes from that for me i imagine for you as well but i have to say as i started seeing what ai was capable of i started feeling a little bit demotivated i started feeling a little like oh man am i just gonna become like um a tiny drop in an ocean of content that's made by AIs that's going to far outpace and outdo everything I can do because it can custom make it to meet the needs of the audience and it can do it in five seconds, whereas I took five years. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. Um, do you feel like there's a, you know, a motivational hit that we could be taking with with something that can step into this domain that was arguably the one real human only domain for so long? Yeah, so I've um, I've had the thought a couple times recently. Like, what I really like to do is um, read a bunch of stuff, and then figure it out in some way and pull it all together in the, the perfect written statement. And then I thought, <laughs> wow, AIs are really good at that. Yeah. Uh, but then I think, well, AIs are not at all good at asking the question that caused all that activity to happen. Um, and that's why I think that that's so critical for them becoming sentient. It took a human to ask the AI the question. Mm. And then the AI short circuited, you know, what the human might have spent, you know, weeks doing. I, it, it's funny, I've been using AI for the first time in this paper that I've been writing. I'll write a paragraph and then I'll plop, plop, it, plop it in the AI and say, how would you edit this or what am I missing? And sometimes I get some good input from that but it's still me driving the bus, you know? And if, if you show me an AI that can do what I'm doing is I'm trying to pull all this stuff together uh, and hopefully make a contribution to the literature, then I'll, I'll really start to feel uh, maybe kind of helpless, but uh, we're not there yet. Yeah, one of my favorite media theorists, Douglas Rushkoff, he did a podcast on the topic recently that kind of shifted my mind in a positive way. He was saying he, fed his chapters to a to an AI and, and had it kind of spit back out what he could write next. And he was being inspired by it for a few chapters, being inspired by it. And then he got to a chapter where it basically wrote the same thing as he did. And he realized that if AI is kind of averaging everything that it gets into a data set, a model that's the most average, he, he was kind of upset with himself because he realized that chapter was like the most average thing mm -hmm. he could have possibly written because the AI wrote the same thing. So he kind of used it as a way to tell himself when he was not being innovative or creative enough. Mm -hmm. It's a nice story, yeah. I... Yeah, that, that was an interesting take. <laughs> um, well, looking forward, you know, so as we kind of get to our time limit here, I want to think a little bit about change and the future orientation of things. And with your happiness research and the things that can be done with our goals, self-determination, autonomy, all of these things, you know, we, we have still this idea that, you know, we have hedonic set points that we kind of come into the world with a predisposed um, level of, of joy or engagement with the world or that, you know, we're always just going to return to our set points. Can, can these set points be changed through this process of self-concordance, through improved goals, through increased autonomy, or do we kind of just always go back to that same hedonic set point? Yeah. <clears throat> well, this gets at some of the early research I did with Sonia Leah Bemersky. Mm. We were interested in, you know, can happiness change or do you always bounce back to your set point? And the approach that we ended up with on that question was as follows. Uh, it's not a set point, it's a set range. Mm. You know, your, your temperament makes it so maybe you're kind of a gloomy, pessimistic person. So you're only gonna be able to range between one and six on a 10 point scale. Um, whereas somebody else, maybe they're ranging between four and nine. Um, and given that perspective, it's not a point, it's a range. What, you're, what we're trying to do is get ourselves in the top end of our set range and keep ourselves there. So if my most likely happiness score is say a five out of 10, that would be my set point, sort of the um, automatic base point. <clears throat> but if I can structure my life through creating activities that are rewarding and fulfilling for me, 
then I can get myself up to a seven and mostly keep myself there. Um, <clears throat> that requires defeating hedonic adaptation, which is the tendency to get used to whatever this great new thing is and start to take it for granted. And so Sonia and I have also written on that question. There's things you can do to keep thing to keep the the new fun thing fresh. Do it different ways. Do it with other people. Um, find competitions that uh, you know maybe g give you a little more stake in it. Um, so you're trying to beat hedonic adaptation to the great new thing, so you can stay in the top part of your set range, and you can do that by really kind of working at it. Don't you, know, you have to keep trying to do it differently and and have new experience of that thing that you uh, that you love or enjoy. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot in what you're saying today that seems to be centered around kind of stepping back and asking questions <laughs> like how can I how can I do this a bit differently? How can I change things a little bit? It seems like questions um, around our goals, a little thoughtfulness around our goals can be really fruitful. Uh, I think that's true. What re regarding like where we could go from here, I guess, and what you would imagine in your world. I like to sometimes get the, the kind of the magic wand interpretation of reality, uh, especially from people like yourself. It, are there things that you could see societally that you would magic wand in a different direction if you could? There's maybe, you know, I often think of basic income myself, right? Like I, I'm yeah. horrible at economics, but I would love the idea of having people have a financial safety net to kind of sure up their survival needs and feel more comfortable taking some risks in their yeah, life, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> is there anything like that for you? Um, that is a favorite idea of mine as well. Um, I think you need to have enough faith in human nature to believe that people given the opportunities and not too much stress uh, can and will do what it takes to be productive and to find mm -hmm. you know a, a good way of living. And so a lot of human problems come from the fact that we still have this sort of dog-eat-dog -dog, um, capitalist society where um, there's kind of a lot of stress and so a lot of people kind of give up or just you know they muddle along and, and never really get anywhere whereas if we made it so everybody if you didn't need to worry about just having enough and you could focus your energy on the thing you cared about we'd end up with a far more productive creative society and the investment would be well worth it even if some slackers took advantage of the universal basic income to, you know, just ride off of everybody else. I still think the investment would be worth it, even in that case. Yeah, I, I, I feel like trading 5% potential slackers for 5% geniuses and innovation and masterpieces and creative, you know, everything would be well worth it as well. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Any any topics, kind of anything that came up in this conversation for you that you thought would have been nice to dig into a bit more, or maybe some thoughts you want to leave off with? Um, this is a little bit out there. I think I can say it quickly. Um, Take as long as you want. I've got time. <laughs> well, okay. One of the reasons I'm interested in this topic of AI sentience is because I'd like to be able to create models of personality that mm. um, would capture the the AI, and so you could sort of run those models forward. This is my my research psychologist speaking, and I thought if you can model an AI's personality, why couldn't you do the same thing to a person? And um, maybe even after that person dies, you can keep running the model, so you've still got them, mm. right? I actually wrote a sci-fi novel, not very well written, but it had these ideas in it that in the future we're all going to have an internal companion that both uh, interacts with us, it's an AI, it's collecting complete data over the course of our life on everything we do, feel, and think. So it's kind of a, like a teacher that's interacting with us as we're young and it's still there as we're old. Uh, and then when we die, it basically could take over for us. It knows everything about us. It could predict 
what we were going to do next almost perfectly, but not completely perfectly, because that's the free will part. Uh, and so then that would bring the question of, oh, so is this uh, artificial simulation of Ken Sheldon, who's still around saying stuff after he has uh, shuffled off the earth, does he have rights? You know, mm. uh, what, how, how seriously should we take this entity? But, you know, I don't think that um, true survival of death is possible, but it's interesting to think about this as one way, you know, that, that you can get a complete model of the person and keep running it. You know, you could have a council of elders. You know, what if you could, uh, what if Galileo was still around doing his Galileo things, or at least his model was? Uh, that could also be a very rich thing to have. Yeah, and per that's one question I did want to kind of touch on. With like the big five, how, how much do you rely on something like the big five personality test and how stable is that across time typically? I don't rely on the big five at all because it doesn't yeah. address the questions I'm interested in. Um, it, it's basically pretty static. I think it's sort of circular to say, mm -hmm. why is that person so social? Oh, they're extroverted. How do you know they're extroverted? Oh, they're social. Yeah, you know, that's to me. That's where you end up with uh, the big five, um, because there's there's not really a dynamic aspect to it. Whereas if you think about motivation and needs and free will and stuff like that, then you can start to um, uh, under, really understand why people do what they do. You need to know their goals. How did they arrive at those goals? Uh, what's working for them about those goals? And to just say, oh, they, here's their, their big five trait score, um, I don't think takes you very far. Yeah, fair enough. Well, uh, any closing thoughts? I know we're coming up on time here, so I want to respect what we set aside for this conversation, but I want to let you close. We have, where's Wits Direction here, the book. I see your book here in the behind me, um, and we'll link that in the show notes and everything. But is there any, any final thoughts or things you want to talk about or promote or share? Um, I think that's been really a very wide ranging co uh, conversation that yep. I enjoyed. So thank you for uh, for going there with me. Um, if people, if any of your listeners have uh, uh, thoughts or suggestions, they can reach out to me on email. I can't promise to to reply, but I would try to. Um, so yeah, thanks for an enjoyable discussion. Yeah, likewise.